Well, I want to welcome everybody tonight to our uh, meeting of the Humanists of BUC. We welcome uh, all members and friends of our church, as well as those in the outer community who may be uh, free thinkers or atheists or agnostics or any of that sort of thing. We welcome them to our meeting. I want to just make uh, one or two announcements. One, this meeting is being recorded, and hopefully we can save the recording, and uh, it will be posted eventually uh, on our Facebook page or on our uh, YouTube channel, and we'll notify you. Um, we're going to stay unmuted while our Mandy is speaking, and then we're going to stay muted during the discussion. And for you to speak or ask a question, you have to unmute yourself. And we're going to try and recognize people by raising their virtual hand, which is uh, by clicking on your name in the participant list, or if you have an iPad or some other devices on more. And those on the telephone will use dial uh, star six. <clears throat> Well, I'm very honored to uh, introduce uh, Reverend Mandy Beal to our, as our speaker tonight. We're actually pretty lucky to have her because, uh, like most people, this is not the career that she planned years ago. In her youth, she uh, aspired to be a musician or maybe uh, uh, an actor in the theater. In fact, even today, she's an accomplished musician on the guitar and the African drum. She also has a master of, sci of uh, science in social work, so she may have been considering a, a, a career in that field. She, man she majored in uh, management of nonprofit organizations and uh, women's and gender studies. And she also is a, a certified yoga instructor in case uh, something happens to her career here at BUC, she has something to fall back on. Um, however, she eventually uh, found the Unitarian UUA movement. Pre she's previously uh, specialized in uh, religious education direction and uh, youth activities. And what attracted uh, her to BUC, one of the things that attracted her was our emphasis on uh, social justice. And I think that's one of the things that was mutual and attracted Mandy to us. She stated that she's deeply committed to social justice as a cornerstone of ministry. And therefore, it's, I'm honored to uh, have Mandy speak to us about values which are most important in humanity. Mandy? Thank you, Larry. I have to say, thank you. That was quite the introduction. I feel as though some of those superlatives may have been added. <laughs> Larry may have oversold me a bit, but I am so glad to be here tonight. Thank you for inviting me. It's always so nice to uh, participate in these meetings, even when we're not seeing each other face to face. So the, the question of the values that humans need to flourish, that's a fascinating question. So I've, I've thought about this for a while and uh, gone over a couple of different ideas. So first I need to make some disclaimers. One, in order to answer this question for me, I, I have to assume that we are talking about people who have their basic needs already met because values change when you are starving or struggling. Right, so we'll, we'll assume here that we're talking about a person who is not in that situation. Secondly, I wanna acknowledge that I have a cultural mindset and it's hard for me to say, I can't say, the one thing that everybody needs, right? So I'm speaking from a specific social location as a white American um, who enjoys a lot of privilege on, on different levels. So that being said, all of that taken into account, the, the value that that I have landed on and I've, I've gone back and forth a lot, but tonight I've decided to propose that the value that is most needed for human flourishing is humility. So humility is a, is a term that I think many people have a negative connotation with. Uh, and I can 
share for myself that my, my previous relationship with this word was, was very negative. So when I was growing up, my brother was a Boy Scout. And I remember going to his courts of honor. And there was always some reading about teaching these boys about humility. And I would get so mad because in my, my kid brain, the word humility was too closely linked to humiliation. And it meant making, making people feel bad and feeling like they're, like they're not enough or they're not good enough or in a servile kind of um, re relationship to the other people. So I, I always had kind of a touchy relationship with this. But then, you know, recently, uh, I don't think it's a big secret that I'm a recovering alcoholic and addict. And I celebrated my sixth anniversary of sobriety yesterday. And as I've been getting closer to that, um, one of the chief principles of Alcoholics Anonymous is humility. And it was in Alcoholics Anonymous that I learned that humility is actually about being right-sized in the world, not being in a relationship where you are over other humans or in which you are under other humans, but you are right-sized and you're holding the appropriate place in the world. So with that definition of humility, um, I really feel like we've, I've arrived at a value that relates to human flourishing or that undergirds human flourishing. So thinking of oneself as being disempowered or too powerful warps our perception of ourselves and our abilities. And if we are not um, understanding ourselves properly in the world, I don't feel that we can flourish. And we certainly cannot flourish as a part of society. And as we will get to, we are never not a part of society. So lack of humility is having uh, an inflated sense of importance. It is taking up too much space in the room or in the world. Uh, your relationship to the world is that you are at its center. You understand, you understand yourself to be at the center of the world. And in that mindset, uh, everybody in your life becomes an extra in the movie of your life. Right, and it, you can't have authentic relationships when you think of other people as being bit players in, in your life. Uh, so some examples of being too big on the world in a, um, a larger scale form, I, I think we can, um, I don't think we're exaggerating or making a, a great claim to say that the United States has had a, an overemphasis on uh, being the center of the world and kind of a lack of humility for a period of time. So when we think about a lack of humility in our cultural context, what comes to mind for me are um, economics as a tool of white supremacy. I used to be in workforce development, so I saw this quite a bit. So uh, you can have this financial aid or you can receive this job training, but only if you do the job training or you get a job that is approved and that is, is considered to be appropriate and which is codified by white people who are elected to serve in um, the bodies of our legislation. So um, you have to speak, dress, and behave in a way that is deemed appropriate and codified by white people. So that is a, a lack of humility in which the government and the people who have elected government legal you know, officials um, are, are determining what is appropriate for people in order for them to get financial aid or job training. Militarism is another great example of not having enough humility in the world. Militarism says that we will pursue our military and strategic interests at any cost, especially over negotiation, because negotiation implies that we are at best equals, and at worst, that we might have to give a little, that my side would have to give a little, uh, which is considered a defeat for a nation that lacks humility. Uh, another area where we see a lack of humility writ large is uh, the environment. We take what we want with impunity, we do not consider the costs and the cost of environmental degradation are also borne out on black indigenous and other people of color. And a very present uh, demonstration of lack of humility as it has come to uh, an interpersonal level, I think lately we've seen this big controversy over masks, right? And I, I saw a picture of someone that had a, a sign up in the window of their car that said, um, my mask is more important than your health, or my liberty is more important than your health, right? Now, that, that's an extreme example, but it really sums up this overinflated 
idea of, of the self as the center of society or the self as the center of, of the world, of the worldview that, that focuses around one person and everybody else just being side characters in that movie. So, um, yeah, that, that's about hyper-individualism, which is, again, rooted in this lack of humility. Uh, on an interpersonal level with, um, with good white liberals, I don't want to sound like I'm just, you know, skewering into a, to one political group here. I feel like all of that has kind of a political bent to it towards one party, but uh, good white liberals also struggle with um, a lack of humility that leads to delusions of grandeur. Uh, it kind of feeds into that uh, political idea of, I know what everyone needs. You know, well, if everyone just ate healthy food, then there would be no cancer. <laughs> or if everyone drove a hybrid, then we wouldn't have an environmental degradation problem. When good white liberals start to think about how they are smarter than, more enlightened than, or more woke than other people, this is also a demonstration of a lack of humility. Uh, a very specific strain of this that has popped up in Unitarian Universalism, which honestly, it hasn't popped up. It's on its way out. Something that was very popular with um, a generation or, or two of ministers ago was the idea of I act with good intentions. And so therefore, I do not need accountability standards. There was a, a kind of a period of time in which many uh, Unitarian Universalist ministers, and I can assume also lay leaders, conducted themselves in a manner which would no longer be tolerated. There's a lot of uh, sexual misconduct and um, abusive language used towards congregants and staff members that would no longer be tolerated. And that was justified on the grounds of acting with good intentions or doing what was best for me. Um, it's just really a kind of moral relativism. And again, demonstrates a lack of humility. Any type of disconnection from the rest of humanity, when one loses one's relationship with others by thinking that one is better than another, that is problematic and demonstrates an inappropriate relationship to humility. Now, the other side of that um, unhealthy relationship to humility is having too much humility. When we have too much humility, that's when we lack confidence. We take that servile role. Uh, we have an inability or a willingness to participate in the human experience or a fully in relationships. Uh, and in this mindset, you might consider your place in the world to be on the sideline. So with not enough humility, your place in the world is at the center of it. And with too much humility, your place in the world is to the side of it. The ways that this shows up um, in life is the feeling, the lack of, hum or having too much humility the overabundance of humility shows up um, as feeling like I can't do anything about the troubles of the world, perhaps being apolitical, thinking that I can't affect change here or my vote doesn't matter, um, politics has nothing to do with me. All of that is about having um, not enough, uh, taking up enough space in the world, choosing to opt out, having too much humility, thinking that you are not part of the human experience. Sometimes this can be a martyr complex, uh, what I want doesn't matter, which leads to resentment, especially in the context of interpersonal relationships. Um, in churches, we can see this where people feel like they don't participate in the congregational process because they feel like their voice won't be heard. And so something happens and then they're mad about it later and then feel like it's okay for them to, to talk about how they're mad about it and they got left out, but it was really them leaving themselves out by not voicing their concerns at the right time. Sometimes when we have too much humility, we might feel overwhelmed to the point of immobilization. We might feel disconnected from others at the personal level or disengaged from uh, the community around us, which is what I was just touching on. Um, also feeling like you are being left out without taking action to be included uh, is a, a demonstration of having too much humility. So finding a healthy relationship with humility uh, knowing when you're right-sized in the world can be hard. It's especially hard uh, for people who have uh, addictions or, or dependencies of, of any kind, uh, which is, again, why it pops up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if we're not raised with the sense of what it is to be right-sized in the world, if we don't have that demonstrated for us, uh, it's a tough thing to know how to gauge. 
So the, the, one of the ways that we know whether or not we're right-sized in the world is through um, how we are reflected in relationships. And you know, being a minister, I, I think that the right answer to this in most problems is church. We go to church. So uh, Unitarian Universalism is a covenantal religious tradition. We believe that we are who we are because of our relationships. We call each other into being through our relationships. Our relationships help us to know our place in the world and help us to know ourselves. So how do we know the nature of anything? Get a bit into epistemology here. There are two theological paths of knowledge. There is the apophatic, which is the negative, the via negativa. And then there's the capophatic, which is the via positiva, the positive. So we'll start off with the apophatic. The apophatic is um, we exist only in the context of relationships, as we said. So the via negativa, the apophatic way of understanding ourselves in relationship is that we define ourselves against something, right? It's, um, it's defining this is a thing and I am not part of that. I am not a part of that community, therefore I am. So an example would be, I am not a conservative, therefore I am kind. I am not a conservative, therefore I am loving. I am not a conservative, therefore I am compassionate. Now, this is not the most accurate way of seeking information because it depends on your perception of the other, which is problematic and that inevitably leads to an abundance or a surfeit of humility. So it's not, it's not the proper way to understand our right relationship to other people. The best use of the apophatic way of thinking about things here is to prove that we are defined by relationship. For example, a hermit can only be a hermit if there is a society to be outside of, right? So we can really only use this negative line of thinking, I am not that, this community is not that, if we are only, only for really trying to prove that we can only exist in relationship, that there is no way of being outside of relationship from humanity. So it's a lot easier to go the apophatic route. I hear this a lot with Unitarian Universalism. One of the hardest struggles that we have in, um, public relations, I guess we can say, is because we tend to say what we're not. Well, we're not a creedal religion, or we're, we don't have any set beliefs, or we don't blah, 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 blah. But that's confusing to people because it implies a value statement immediately. It's off-putting because it implies a value statement. And it's also confusing because it assumes that you have a cultural context for what it is that we're saying we're not, right? So we are much more successful when we say what we are. So the cataphatic way of understanding ourselves in relationship is to say, I am a part of this and therefore I am, right? I am a part of this community and therefore I am this. I'm a part of this family and therefore I'm that. So if we look at Birmingham Unitarian Church's covenant, we can say I am a part of this community, therefore I am my best self in all interactions. I'm a part of BUC, therefore I assume best intentions. I am part of BUC, I think of the, the humanity of others, which means I extend grace and kindness. I am a part of BUC, therefore I pause before reacting, therefore I react to situations in a solutions-oriented manner. And that all comes from our, our covenant, right? The covenant defines who we are in positive terms. So that's a lot <laughs> to lay down, but you know, you invite the minister, you're going to get some big words. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> um, just to sum it up though, uh, I find humility to be the value that is most important for human flourishing because it puts us in right, right relationship to one another. And I can't flourish if you don't flourish because we call each other into being through our relationships. So it's, it's, it's a two-way street. Otherwise, it's not really flourishing. It's dominance, which is a different discussion altogether. So humility is what is required for human flourishing. And we understand the amount of humility that we have and the quality of humility that we have through our relationships with one another and the context of those relationships, what is reflected back to us through those relationships. At least for tonight, that's what I think.
Oh, Larry, I think you are still on mute. I have unmuted. <laughs> We're going to have our question and answer and discussion period. Please raise your virtual hand if you would like to enter into the discussion. Does anybody like to start? I'm not finding the uh, hand icon, but I do have a question. Can I go ahead? You can, you have our permission. Uh, okay. Uh, Reverend Mandy, um, I'm sure you have more than one value that you think, think are, is important. I was thinking that you were gonna mention and I guess you did briefly, love and compassion and kindness, gratitude and respectfulness and responsibility, things like that. Can you name some other important values that you think are important? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I will say though, before answering that, um, I do feel Yes, all of those are important. And the reason I settled on humility is because I feel like if we don't have that right relationship, then our love becomes sometimes controlling and sometimes our compassion becomes um, pity, right? Uh, so the other thing that I really struggled with that I wanted, my original thought for tonight was I, I have said a few times today that I'm minorly obsessed with the interplay between individualism and the common wealth, right? Because if we are focused only on the individual, and this again relates to the concept of humility, then we act in a selfish manner that does not maintain the well-being of other people. And if we act exclusively in the well-being of the commonwealth, then we miss, um, we, can, we find it feeling resentful and we miss taking care of ourselves and our, our families. So having that, that interplay, I think is really important too. <clears throat> I'm going to try and, uh, uh, yesterday I spent uh, a few hours uh, on Zoom at the annual meeting of the American Humanist Association. It was extremely exciting and I don't know if anybody else, but one of the sessions which really uh, I found very intriguing was the one on the 10 commitments, living humanist values. It was a half hour presentation by the values were developed by their education arm. I'm going to try and show these on the screen. If not, I have them on my iPhone. I can record them. Can we see these 10 commitments? Yeah, yeah, I can see them. Okay, if, uh, what they, they, they said this was gonna be a circle because there's nothing, none of them are more important than others. And uh, if you notice down in the bottom in green is a little one called humility. <laughs> but uh, they mentioned others, if we start on the top, there's critical thinking. I will practice good judgment by asking questions and thinking for myself. Ethical development, I will always focus on becoming a better person. Peace and social justice, I will help people solve problems and handle disagreements to, in ways that are, far, are, are fair for everyone. Service and participation, I will help my community in ways that let me get to become the people I'm helping. Altruism, I will help others in, in me without, with helping, without the need for helping for rewards. Humility, I will be aware of my strengths and weaknesses and appreciate the strengths and weaknesses of others. Environmentalism, I will take care of the earth and the life on it. Global awareness, I will be a good neighbor to the people who share the earth with me and help make the world a better place for everyone. And responsibility, I will be a good person even when no one is looking and when the consequences of my action. 
and empathy, I will consider other people's thoughts, feelings, and experiences. I wonder, uh, I'm going to uh, unmute, uh, go back to that, but I want to know if um, Mandy or anybody else has any comments about those. They look, right. they look excellent to me. You said what? They look excellent to me. It's, it's yeah. 10, 10 great yeah, they, values. This recently developed, and I hope to use it in their educational arm, particularly with, uh, with youth and children and, and what humanism is. <clears throat> and it was a great annual meeting of the American Humanist Association. I will say it's interesting to note that those are all defined in the positive, right? Because we're just saying yeah. the cataphatic and the adiphatic. So I feel like it's a lot of times, especially humanism is defined as what it's not, right? We don't believe in God. We don't believe in a higher power, right? But it's, it's nice when we can say what something is instead of what it is not. So I, I appreciate that. Great. Right. I mean, I'm going to unmute everybody. Maybe we'll sort of have a more of a free discussion without worrying about raising our hands. Well, one thing we were going to ask you, Reverend Mandy, is how you could be a, a humanist and also a theist. <laughs> well, okay, so those two do not exist in opposition to each other. Theist and an atheist <laughs> might exist in opposite of each other, right? A theist means without God and theist means with God, right? But a humanist and a theist are not necessarily in opposition. So who here, besides looking at those 10 commitments that you just had, who can define what is humanism without saying what it's not? What is it? All, all 10. LOL. Okay, so without having someone else define it, what is humanism for you? Uh, speaking, speaking here, I, I do agree with the, the all 10 uh, principles there. Um, one of the uh, mottos of the American Humanist Association is, is good without God. But if you take the without God part out, it still means good. And I think those 10 principles are, are the, the good values that are to be encouraged. And uh, I did also see that presentation yesterday. Uh, the, one of the uh, uh, people putting it together was involved with the Humanist Institute. And also uh, one of the originators was a gentleman who was a native of India, where he uh, encountered multiple religions. Uh, he himself was of Sikh background, S-I-C-K-H, I believe, or S-I-K-H. And uh, he tried to, to universalize things. And that particular, um, set of 10 has been translated into a number of different languages and has been received well around the world. So it does seem like a very positive way of defining what humanism is. Mm -hmm. So humanism is not monolithic, just like a belief in God or a specific belief in God is not monolithic. It's not any one thing, right? And there was humanism before there was the American Humanist Association. I have to point out, it is a bit ironic that a group of people who build themselves as free thinkers are looking to an institution to define what something is for them. Eh? So, no. on your own steam, what is humanism? Now, critical thinking was one of the elements of that, and I think everybody's entitled to their own particular views. Yeah, there's secular humanism, there's religious humanism. Clearly, it's not a dogma but it's, it's a general set of principles that I think are, are unifying to various people. So I, I think that that 10, uh, the wheel of 10 is actually a pretty good uh, definition. Mm -hmm. The Humanist uh, Manifesto 3 says that humanism is an ethical philosophy that doesn't rely on a supernatural being that wants to create a better world. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. So I completely agree with that, right? So we can believe, or I can believe, humanism is the belief that theological imperatives are born out in the human experience, right? <clears throat> so it is completely compatible for me to have belief in a God who also 
allows and wants theological imperatives to be borne out in the human experience. Those two to me do not live in opposite realms. So I fall, I think, probably more into like a process theology perspective, which is kind of straddles the, the line between atheism and theism in, in a lot of ways. But remember the original humanists were Christians, right? The original humanists were in the Italian Renaissance and made their way into Poland, uh, believed that Jesus was a human. And that was the beginning of the phrase humanism, right? So it's, it's not too different. It's, it's two different systems that can exist in the same space. You know, they're not, they're not in, in entirely opposite of each other. Um, and humanism did not begin as a, um, a foil to theism or to Christianity. It, it was just a different line of thinking within those same moral and ethical systems. And then in recent years has taken on that connotation, but had a life outside of that, just like Christianity had, or the teachings of Jesus, the church had a life outside of what is now, um, you know, carceral Christianity or a, a, a imperial, imperial type of, of Christianity. So that's, that's, how I, that's how I get there. Um, I also believe in Jesus as a human rather than Jesus as divine. Um, I do not believe that God interferes in human affairs. But I also think I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the humility there too, right? Like I have thoughts, but that doesn't make them true. Just like all of us have thoughts and ideas. I think we have to leave a little space where maybe, maybe we don't know. But I, I, I don't think that... Um, I don't think that uh, God interferes in, in human affairs in a major way. I think that we're responsible, right? We create our own messes and therefore we're responsible for cleaning them up. But do you talk to God? Uh, no, he doesn't interfere. Uh, well, I definitely wouldn't say he when talking about God. Oh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do have a, a rich prayer life and I, I'm not shy about talking about this either, but you know, I believe in prayer as a, as a conversation um, and isn't that about asking for things, which actually, I think prayer was given back to me again through Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, which is a, which is a program that challenges people because it has a lot of God language. I know that, but there are a lot of people who make it through AA anyway, right? Because if this is your lifeline, you have to figure it out. Um, so in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a section about what they call the Santa Claus prayer, like a, a prayer that like a, a greedy child puts together for Santa Claus. Give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that, right? I don't think of that as being a very rich and full prayer life. And again, who, who am I to say what somebody else should be doing in their own spiritual practice? But for me, I don't find that to be very deep or rewarding. Prayer to me, you know, maybe somebody else would consider it, you know. Everybody has, there's, there's enough people who want to throw stones at me and say it's, you're not a real Christian or you're not really praying. But it's a matter of reflection, deep reflection and the consideration of being in touch with something outside of myself. Now, if you wanted to take a really, you know, staunch uh, atheistic stance on that, you could still call that connection to the web of life, right? There's still something that exists outside of, of us, whether we consider that the community or the mystery of life that is beyond our understanding. I just shortened that and call it God. Donna, I see that you have your hand up. Oh, you're still on mute though. Everybody's unmuted right when, now. You can... I'm sorry. When you were talking about humility, you used the phrase being right-sized. Mm. I don't think I fully understand, or I would like you to expand upon what you mean by being right-sized. Sure. Another phrase that comes from Alcoholics Anonymous. So when we're right-sized in the world, we have our understanding of who we are in relationship to those around us, who we are in the world, and who we are in the face of mystery and not knowing, right? So it's not a matter of being scared or afraid of mystery. It's just understanding that there is mystery and there is us, right? And not feeling the need to dominate or shrink away from other people in relationships. Does that clear that up? I feel yeah. like it can be a little misty and abstract. So. But sometimes the abstractness makes it whole. Hmm. So, I'm okay with that. Thank you. Yeah. Brad, you have your hand up. Brad? Uh oh, I, just I think need he's to get gone. to the unmute. Uh, there you button. are. Yeah, just a note for our uh, uh, planning next time. I think that the speaker brought up a good point. We should uh, say gently that, yeah, there's a 
we tend to have a limit on the big words in here so we can try to absorb the the big ideas <laughs> this feels the uh, this feels like being back in college <laughs> concentrate uh -huh. so I'd like, to, I'd like to take a stab at answering your question reverend in that uh, after 9 11 i started uh i think i was just working and not thinking too much but and then it's like well, how could these people have done something so horrible in the name of uh, religion and then thought and then come to think, well, maybe this is just a subset or maybe this is not a representative of this religion. But then some of these religions, uh, if you embrace them to their letter, would exclude beliefs of other religions. And I found that uh, me meaning the only one true way is through such and such. And I thought, wow. That's uh, pretty self-centered to be able to exclude anybody else. I found that most people had a belief, uh, the religious belief was based on their zip code uh, where, they, where they grew up. So I thought, how can this be? Then I heard uh, a TED talk a couple years ago from an African minister who said, why choose humanism over theism? And he said that sometimes the, some of the poorer countries such as mine, people are taught to uh, pray that something, uh, there will be some intervention. And he says, and I think this is bad because it may result in people not taking action to help their own situation where they need to. So I think I'm a humanist because this challenges me to come up with a set of criteria that would be my barometer for how to behave. Um, given if I, uh, if we are not a, a nation of religion, which is what our uh, preamble to the governing body states for the United States where we're all living in here. So that's that's how I would interpret that. That's my challenge to find uh, this and maybe these uh, 10 uh, commitments that they said we call them commitments and had 10 of them. Yeah, that's kind of a more than a coincidence uh, that there's sometimes called 10 commandments. So it gets folks to think, but I think that would be uh, my, my interpretation how I would answer that. Would make a comment here if I may, and I would sort of go off of your comments there, Brad. One of the, uh, the criticisms of uh, AA, and, and I don't have direct personal knowledge, but people feel like you're told to go to the outside, to trust something from the outside to take care of yourself as opposed to take care of yourself from within. And there's an organization we call the Secular Organization for Sobriety, or SOS, which attempts to follow the same principles <clears throat> but does so from an individual responsibility viewpoint. And that it, I believe there's some connections also with the AHA as far as uh, networking. And some courts are, are accepting that as an alternative to AA for people that don't feel like they wish to have uh, a value system imposed upon them, but wish to uh, develop their own through something like that. So I would make a plug for that and for more individuality through SOS. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard of that. There is a chapter in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that's called for us, us agnostics. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges for me with uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was not that there was a, a concept of God. It was the way that God was portrayed was so challenging hmm. for me because this is a book written by two dudes in the 30s, right? So they have a very specific idea of who God is and what God is like. And I, I just, I found it so, so very upsetting. Um, but, you know, I think if I could have gotten someplace on my own steam, I, I'd have gotten there, you know, depending on myself, uh, got me to one specific outcome every single time. So um, the, the idea of needing to look outside of myself for some type of um, something was, uh, was really important, you know, and, um, you know, I feel like I'm at a, a point now in my sobriety in my life that I have a lot more trust for myself because I've demonstrated my ability to be trustworthy. I'm, you know powerless over alcohol, but um, I'm very trustworthy in a lot of ways that at the time I was not trustworthy because of my addiction. I feel like it's dark. Can you guys see me? Eh. Okay. I would encourage you to look into secular organization for sobriety and see if there's some things in there that you would find to be of value that maybe could be shared with others who, who may wish to uh, develop from, from more, uh, well, without looking to the outside as much. And uh, I think it, it's a, a worthy program. It might be worth exploring and sharing with others. Yeah, everything's worth taking a look at. 
Thanks for tipping us off. Far away from this microphone, I think. There was one uh, uh, statistic at the uh, AHA uh, annual meeting that I found very interesting. Several years ago, if you uh, asked the public, would you support an atheist to be a president? Well, less than 10% less than of the respondents said they support an atheist. And, to, and recently, in the same survey, nearly 50% of the respondents said they would support an atheist as president. So I think free thinking and humanism and atheism is, is beginning to flourish. When was the first date, Larry? The first date? Yeah, the 10% date? It was less than 10%, around 7% what date of respondents that? felt that they could support some a candidate who was an atheist as president, where today uh, it was a little less than 50% felt they could support. When, when they asked about uh, Catholicism or Hindu, any other religion or LGBTQ, over 90% of the respondents, or a woman, over 90% of the respondents said they could support that, that person as a presidential candidate. But that wasn't true several years ago. Reverend? Yes. This is Walt. If hey, I Walt. heard you correctly, you said that the essence of being human is relationships. Yeah. And I would like to ask you, how does a person practice humanism in their daily interactions with people beyond saying hello? Humanism or human relationships? Well, for me, there isn't as much of a uh, distinction, but um, in terms of what you're saying, human relationships. Mm -hmm. how, how does a humanist conduct themselves during their human relationships? All right. Uh, I think learning how to see the ways in which we are inherently and intrinsically connected is a big part of that and understanding that we are one human family, right? Like being called into existence through relationships is Unitarian Universalism 101, right? We share a common origin. We share a common destiny. Uh, we, can't, we can't be here without each other. We're all made of the same matter. We're made of stardust. We're made of the earth. Therefore, we cannot be disconnected from one another. So seeing another person as a human, as opposed to, I am not that, but I, I am that. This person and I are part of the same thing, even if we're coming from different perspectives, uh, different realities, different social, cultural location, different affiliation, different what have you. Underneath all of that, we are humans here together. On, on one human experience, one human experiment. Thank you. Yeah. There's a uh, uh, core value that I think is important, but which hasn't been mentioned, and that's uh, curiosity. Because I think science and technology is what caused the uh, human population to flourish. If, Darwin hadn't been curious, we wouldn't have had a theory of evolution. If Galileo hadn't been curious, we wouldn't have had a telescope and been able to straw the cosmos. If the Wright brothers hadn't been curious about how birds fly, we wouldn't have had air flight. So I just think that's a, a core value which is very important to the flourishing of humanity. Anyone like, anyone like to comment on that? Oh, Larry, you're on mute. Those are excellent, Larry. Hmm? I agree. Engineers do, <clears throat> do well. Engineers and scientists are very useful. Right. <laughs> Does anyone else have core values which haven't been mentioned? I personally well, I, I, I wanted to, I was didn't realize I was on mute, so I was trying to 
talk to about relationships with uh, Reverend Mandy. Mm -hmm. I've always been disappointed that we don't make a real big deal out of Mother's Day and Father's Day, Grandparents' Day, and even mar a Marriage Day or a Friendship Day. They all have to do with relationships. What do you think about that? Well, Father's Day is after the end of the worship year. So there's that. <laughs> just just on a like a really practical level there's there's that um mm -hmm. the difficulty of celebrating specific relationships is that not all of us have had the same experience of those specific relationships right and so there's a lot of complexity that has to be brought in there i do acknowledge mother's day uh when it comes up usually in the form of a prayer um I tried to do the same thing with Father's Day this this past year because we were having a you know our, our worship calendar kind of was was wonky <laughs> this year kind of drug on forever so, um, so I did I did do that but you know I don't think that I would center any specific service about any specific type of relationship because not all of us have the same experience of that like that would be so hard you know to to draw into. Um, I need a, a touch point, something concrete to work off of. And it, there is no concrete experience or piece of literature on, on that, that I think, I don't know. I don't know. Now that I'm talking about that, I'm like, no, I don't feel that way about like religious scripture or poetry. I don't know, Larry. Like, I, I think it's a, it's a good idea, but again, Father's Day falls outside of the regular worship year. So it feels unfair to. Yeah. What I was thinking is that none of us would be here without a mother or a father. And most of us needed a marriage and we have uh, grandparents, so I, I like that. But the other thing I wanted to mention was, you, you don't rely on God for, to give you something. But I'm wondering no. why you speak to God if he's not gonna, or she, if it's not gonna do anything for you. Because I found it to be fruitful. <laughs> why do we do anything? Because, because we find it to have value, right? Um, yeah, and I will that, that is my, say, that's my question. What is the value of your God? Yeah. Well, before I answer that, I will back up and say some of us are here despite our mothers. Some of us are here despite our fathers. And some of us don't have a mother or a father, right? And there are a lot of people who are raised in uh, marriages where there is not a mother or a father and a lot of people who aren't raised with marriages at all. So, so there is some complication there. Um, so I, my, my prayer practice is based in spiritual direction. I have a spiritual director that I meet with on almost a monthly basis. Uh, it is based in asking questions. Now, whether or not I'm communing with something outside of myself, which feels important to me, or if I'm, you know, meditating and getting more in touch with myself, I, I think he could probably have whatever, you know, you can think whatever you want to think about me and my prayer life and my practices. But, but for me, it is fruitful to think about asking questions and um, receiving new insights. You know, it's, it's always, you know, if one hesitates to tell people that they, um, you know, talk to God and God talks back, right? This is, this is, this is a thing that one might hesitate to say, but um you know, when I have a piece of insight that I feel is not something I would have come to on my own, that feels very much like I have had a level of communication with something that is outside of myself. That can anything originate inside of us that doesn't come from within us? Probably not. I don't know. Could we have a philosophical debate about that? I'm sure we could. But I think the thing is that curiosity is important, as Larry brought up, but so is mystery right? If we just like dig into everything and take it all apart, then we lose some of the wonder that I think is important in life. I always want to give a little space to things. Well, what, what surprised me about three weeks ago is when you started your prayer by saying, most gracious and loving God. Yeah, like that was a... It was seems a, like it's, God is just so important to you. Uh, maybe number one. Yeah, I don't, I don't often pray publicly that way, but that was a service that was dedicated to the redemption of Christianity. So, so I did there. If, we, if we're going to be praying a specific, or we're going to be using a specifically Christian uh, piece of scripture or, um, you know, theological concept, then I might say that. I also start off all of the services that we are looking at a Jewish concept. I start the prayer with, um, you know, Barukatah Adonai Eloheinu, but I say it in, in English, you know, um, yeah. So I, I just, yeah, I, I try to, you know, and if, if we were, you know, using Islam, I would, you know, use 
um, some of the 99 names for God there too. It just feels appropriate. Well, usually you pray to the spirit of life and, and love, which I, can, I think a humanist could say that too, because yeah. they're kind of invisible things. And I think that we can all agree that, you know, we do things in the spirit of whatever, you know, in the, in the spirit of, we, we, you know, we like to do things in the spirit of Christmas. You know, we do things in the spirit of love and kindness, etc. cetera. Um, I need a touch point to get started. The thing about Unitarian Universalist prayers is sometimes the way that we are uh, entering the prayer and naming the, the forces upon which we call can be longer than the prayer itself, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is not good. So I need, I need a, something to get started. And so um, landing on spirit of love and life as um, I think Manish, I think my internship supervisor used to use that a lot. So that's been helpful. I wanted to share something with you if you don't mind. Um, this is a poem that I just read earlier today for the first time. This is by Aldous Huxley and it's called Island. Island by Aldous Huxley. Lightly child, lightly. Learn to do everything lightly. Yes, feel lightly even though you're feeling deeply. Just lightly let things happen and lightly cope with them. I was so preposterously serious in those days, such a humorless little prig. Lightly, lightly, it's the best advice ever given me, even when it comes to dying. Nothing ponderous, nothing portentous, nothing emphatic, no, no rhetoric, no tremulous, no self-conscious persona putting on its celebrated imitation of Christ or little Nell. And of course, no theology, no metaphysics, just the fact of dying, the fact of the clear light. So throw away your baggage and go forward. There are quicksands all about you, sucking at your feet, trying to suck you down into fear and self-pity and despair. That's why you must walk so lightly. Lightly, my darling, on tiptoes and no luggage, not even a sponge bag, completely unencumbered. I just, to me, it is very important to stay clear of thinking we've got it. Because when you think you got it, you've missed something right? Certainty and triumphalism are challenging things. Fundamentalism of any stripe doesn't leave any space for the, po the possibility of having gotten it wrong. And I think it's just important that we remember that we may have gotten it wrong. And to answer the question earlier from Walt about how do we live out humanism in a, a deeper way in, in relationship with one another, you know, the bits of, of truth that we all hold have value. Right? So for me to feel that my truth is the one and only truth excludes you and what you believe to be the truth. So I just think it's very important that we extend each other some grace and know that we, we come to things on, on our own way in our own steam, but we're, we're, all just, we're all just trying to figure this out together as we go. Very well said. I remember one time in a worship service when I was leading a prayer, I used a phrase I heard from another minister, to the one we call by many names. Mm -hmm. Because that way it did not matter how one might address their prayer. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a, a comforting way to include everyone. But I'm sure I left someone out somewhere. Yeah, I've been known to say, um, we pray to many names and no name at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll make a comment here, if I may. Um, I re recall uh, the candlelight services a number of years ago at BUC with Doug Gallagher. And uh, one of the things he would do, when he would light candles uh, for, for the congregation. And he would light a candle for Moses and a candle for Buddha and a candle for Christ. And he would light one more candle for uh, prophets yet to come. Mm. And I appreciated that because that means we're still open to things that are going to happen. And um, I, I miss the candlelight services. They, uh, I, I think the fire marshal had something to say about that, but I thought that was a nice touch. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Yeah, revelation is not sealed, right? And as, as soon as we think we've got it again, then, then we've lost it. Uh, I'd like to say that, uh, that uh, I think is your topic of humility is really important because I'm definitely a humanist, but I'm also aware that the history of humanists is that, like I say, humans above all. They, didn't, they had no real feeling for the creatures around them at all. They, like 
talked about, uh, I think it's Roger Bacon experimenting on live dogs and said, well, they're just automatons, they don't do anything. So while I'm a, I'm a humanist, I realize that the history is, is not always perfect. <laughs> So. Yeah, you know, you get more than a couple people together, something gross is going to happen. You know, that's just, <laughs> that's, that's just true. You know, like there is not a, any type of group or identity or anything that hasn't had problems. It's just, you know, I don't know. It's part of the way that we're engineered. This is where we get into the question of evil. So <laughs> we're like out of time. So I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> I was just hearing from uh, Jane Goodall uh, this morning, and she was saying that uh, all the good qualities that humans have are also, to some extent, with other animals, like elephants and whales and so forth. They have uh, a very, they're very somewhat similar to the um, uh, humans. Yeah, Jane Goodall also wrote about the existence of evil in the animal kingdom, right? She talks about monkeys uh, waging war against one another, uh, cannibalism, the eating of each other's young, et cetera. But again, we're almost out of time, so we're not, we're not going to get anything. But, um, nothing about us is separate from anything around us. Well, it's 8 o'clock, and uh, we promised people will be over. So anyone who has to leave, please do so. Uh, if other people would like to continue with the discussion, we can stay a little longer. Can you stay, Mandy? Yeah, I can. I can give you guys a few more minutes, but this is also my third third thing of the day, so okay. <laughs> just a few more, then I'm going to go. <laughs> okay. Very good. I'd I'd like to say I've really enjoyed this discussion, and okay. I'd I'd like to see see us colluding on helping people migrate towards humanism. It sounds like by those percentages, we're already making progress relative to the atheism thing, but we don't need to focus on that. We don't need to focus on doing just without the supernatural. I mean, Adams beat Jefferson by calling him an atheist, right? I like the Jefferson Bible. He thought they'd make a great moral framework. He cut out all the supernatural. But you know, that, I like this to focus on our moral framework and then hold people accountable that violate it. Perhaps that's the brave part of our humility. Well, I think this should be finished for the evening, and uh, I really want to again express my appreciation to Reverend Mandy and to everyone who attended. Thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Reverend Mandy. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Everyone have a great night. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.